So again, on behalf of the president of the Einstein Society, Professor Ott, um, I would like to welcome you to the last of our 2023 Einstein lectures. Now, before I start my introduction, let me ask, is there anyone in the audience who hasn't been here yesterday or the day before? Oh, interesting. Um, so, uh, in this case, I will, I will still briefly introduce Marina to those. It's, it's a larger portion than I had thought. Um, so, this is the 14th edition of the Einstein Lectures. We will complete the, the cycle of five times with philosophy next year. So, this is the fifth Einstein uh, series um, of mathematics. Uh, my name is Christiane Tretta, I'm Professor of Mathematics here at the University in Bern and it has been a pleasure to have Marina already for two evenings, uh, Professor Marina Vyazowska, Chair in Number Theory at EPFL, so her travel wasn't too far. And um, so Marina uh, sticks out uh, in various respects, um, not just because of her young age, um, but also with, with her life and, and, and we had the pleasure to listen to her already two days and I think her enthusiasm for mathematics and for basic research in particular um, has been uh, really transpiring to the whole audience. So I met Marina for the first time uh, actually in the moment um, of her of the, of the high point of her career so far, namely when she was awarded the Fields Medal in 2021 in Helsinki. And before this uh, prize, uh, a whole series of other prizes uh, poured upon her after she had published on Archive, the free math preprint server, her solution of the sphere packing problem in dimension eight alone and then with co-authors, the one in dimension 24. So we are very happy to have you here and look forward to your third talk uh, on the sphere packing problem. Please. Well, Christa, thank you very much for the introduction. So this is uh, the third talk. And uh, so today I will speak about the sphere packing problem in high dimensions and their connection to error correcting codes. And so because there are people who have not been to the first two lectures, so maybe I'll start by repeating a little bit. Uh, so we will, so what, uh, so before we spoke about the sphere packings, and so uh, this is somehow a symbolic depiction of what the sphere packing uh, problem is. So we have a very big box and we have an infinite supply of uh, equally sized hard balls, and we are putting the balls into this box as many balls as we can and we our goal is to uh, <clears throat> produce this densest possible configuration and because the, somehow the, the, the uh, game we are playing is that the uh, box is much bigger than the balls and so what happens is the boundary of the box becomes unimportant to us and you're only focusing on what happens in the bulk and only interested not in an exact number of balls because that might de de depend in some very complicated way on the size or exact parameters of the box, but we are really only interested in the density. And so now an interesting twist to the story. So we are going to consider this if in Euclidean space of different dimensions. And so something what I already spoke about last time, so this, this is how dimensions one, two, and three look like. And now what we would like to do, we would like to go to higher dimensions. And so how do we do it? So we do it by uh, in <clears throat> introducing more coordinates for points in our uh, Euclidean space. So here is uh, uh, the picture we can see here. This is the uh, three-dimensional Euclidean space. And in uh, Euclidean space, each point has three coordinates. And so the thing which we are going to do now, uh, we will simply add more coordinates to our list. And instead of three, we can consider four or eight or 24 or D for any natural number D. And so here we do so and uh, 
So this would be our points in the space. And also in our d-dimensional space, what we want to do, we want still being able to compute distance between points. Uh, and if we, uh, so we will do it by uh, applying the uh, Pythagoras rule. So just the distance between two points is the square root of the, of the sum of squares of differences of respective co coordinates. And so this works, of course, in dimension one, in dimension two, in dimension three, and we can just, by analogy, continue this to d dimensions. And so once we, uh, have, we have defined what is a point and what is uh, the distance in our space, we can also say about what is the ball. And as usual, so uh, the ball of the centered point X and radius R, it will be the set of all points in our uh, Euclidean space, which are the distance at most R from the center. And so another thing is we want to speak about sphere packing and density of sphere packing. It's important for us to have the notion of volume. And so here they have this natural one which comes from computing determinants and it works in dimension one, two, three, and also can be generalized to higher dimensions. And probably I will not go into technical details uh, here. And so what I would like to speak about today is to speak about how this, uh, well, how thinking about d-dimensional spaces where dimension d is big, how this can be useful in real life. And so here one, Maybe there are more than one way how we could use this, but one uh, beautiful example of how the sphere packing, or in some sense also not, maybe not the exact sphere packing, but also the idea of sphere packing can be used in a very applied field of engineering, so-called error correction. And so I'm sure that somehow that it's possible that all this uh, uh, somehow the engineering devices, they would even work without the uh, math mathematical uh, uh, abstraction behind it. But what mathematics was good for is actually for to explaining this and uh, making this very intuitive and uh, organizing thoughts around this. So the, uh, his the story of error correcting codes starts during and right after the Second World War. And so the ideas I'm going to talk about now, they originated in uh, one particular library, uh, laboratory, the Bell Labs in United States. So probably you have heard about Bell Labs already be because there a lot of amazing technology come from uh, that place. And so it happened that the error correcting was introduced not once, but somehow tw invented twice in that laboratory by Claude Chen and, and Richard Hemming. And the legend is that they worked in the same uh, institution and they had their offices next to each other and they were both thinking about error correction into different contexts and they never spoke to each other about it. And so they discovered that they work on the same uh, question only after their papers were published. And so, uh, and uh, actually, so Marcel Gallet, it's, an, it's another, uh, it's a Swiss engineer who was also working, worked at the Bell Labs. And so his contribution to the field so is that he invented one of the very effective early codes that will also play important role in our, in the story I'm telling you in the story of sphere packing. And so let me start with Richard Hemming. So Richard Hemming uh, was using one of the early c computers and at the uh, middle of the last century, this is, this, so this is how the modern computer looked like, looks like, and this is how a computer looked like back then. So he was not working with a computer, you rather would have to work inside of the computer. And uh, uh, computer programs, they were written on such a medium, which were punctured paper tapes, and I think they, people stopped using them maybe even before I was born, so it's really ancient history now. Uh, 
And an important uh, feature of this technology was that it was very unreliable. And computer often made a lot of mistakes. And if, uh, so during the weekdays, uh, assistants worked in this building, and if mistake was made, uh, then the computer could detect a mistake. So there was already a mechanism how to detect a mistake. Uh, but if a mistake occurred, then the computer would stop, and the assistant would have to somehow restart the, the process. And uh, Hemming he often worked on uh, weekends, and on weekends there would be no assistants here, so then the program would stop, and then he would lose time, and this made him very upset. And so this is how he decided to introduce this uh, error correction and introduce uh, somehow codes which could not only detect but also correct errors. And at the same time, uh, Claude Shannon, he was also thinking about error correction but in a slightly other uh, settings. So here is his uh, important uh, paper which actually sets out, uh, so to say, so say, say it starts a new, chapel, a new field of study, which is information theory. So here he describes what he writes about is uh, another situation is when we transmit channel, for example, by radio or by uh, uh, other means. So when we emit signal in one place and then uh, uh, somehow capture it into another and some noise might be introduced. And so here he has some important ideas. He, so this is how the, uh, somehow, this is a very, uh, I would say, vulgarized version of his, he, so he wrote this, the, uh, this, he wrote down the scheme for uh, communication, channel for, for uh, signal transmission, and this is a much simplified and vulgarized scheme. So you could think of this as signal being sent here, and then it is, transmitted by some means, and so in the, while it is transmitted, there might be some noise, for example, some noise coming from bed, whether if it's, uh, these are radio waves. And so the, what I, so the, my signal here, let's, I will depict it as a point inside of the square, because from our point inside of a square, it is some uh, meaningful information that people might send to each other. And so then, when I, after I transmitted it, what people would receive, so they should have received the signal right here. But then because of the noise, it could happen that an error occurred and the signal actually shifted somewhere far away. And so now the question is how to, yeah, so how, how, if, if I received this message, first, how do I know that the message is wrong? And also if I know that it's wrong, is it still possible for me to understand that this was the initial message? So how is this possible? And so here, somehow in this paper, actually Claude Shannon, he suggests, he explains how this can be done. And so what he writes, I think the important thing is here, so first he writes that we, like, we, don't, we will forget about meaning of our signal. So signal, this might be some words or some sentences, some commands, and they're supposed to have some meaning, but let's forget about this. So what we are sending, we are just sending each other numbers. So we encode our signal in numbers and meaning is not relevant for us anymore. And now another important thing is that whatever signal we are sending, we will just, we will for, before we are say, actually start communicating, we will pre-select uh, the certain set of messages that we can send to each other. So we will not send anything what could go through the channel. We will only have some pre-selected set of messages, code words that we are going, that's why it's called code. So some code words that we are allowed to send to each other. And then somehow this already uh, helps us with error detection because if I know that somehow only the final number of uh, code words exist, and I received something which does not coincide with any code word, then I will understand, aha, uh -huh, there was a mistake here. And another thing, is that if I know that there is a mistake, how can I correct it? And so this is where the sphere packing, or at least the philosophy of sphere packing, becomes useful. So what uh, Shannon suggested is to choose these code, code words to be far away from each other in some sense. So this is where the notion of distance becomes important and useful. So we'll choose them far away from each other. And so 
then if uh, the uh, uh, signal is corrupted a little bit, I could still think of my distance and could think which of my code words is the closest to the signal. And this is how I could decode the signal. So if you think, for example, I don't know, maybe it's a, not, not sure if it's a safe joke to make here, but if you can think of a French language, then maybe this is an example of a bad code because you make a slight, slight mistake and the meaning of your word is just changed completely. At the same time, the German language is a very effective, at least good in the sense of a distance. Because somehow words are long, so if you, even if you make a mistake, your vis-a-vis -vis would be able to probably guess what you wanted to say. At the same time, the, there is also a price to pay, is that words usually normally become very long. And actually, same problem is with codes. So if you want codes to be very safe, then the, our code words become uh, longer, and this is somehow the whole game of coding theory, how to make code effective and as German language, uh, so it's like it's safe as German, and effective as French, where you need to say something, you just say like a few sounds, and it's already a sentence, and it could be the whole story. So <laughs> how to somehow make to the best of two worlds and mix them together. And so this is where the sphere packing is actually, uh, the, the uh, idea of sphere packing becomes very useful. Uh, so now this is this uh, gray box, this is our channel, these are all the signals of, in, in this somehow, in my story, of course it would not be a very practical channel, but in this story somehow every signal it would be two real numbers, uh, probably between like zero and one, and okay, it's not a very, it's not a great message, but it is a message. So suppose that this message can take, consists of two real numbers. And then what I decide that I will not send any pair of uh, these numbers, but I will send only these code words. So this red, the coordinates of these uh, red points, these are the signals I, will, I, will, I agreed with uh, the receiver that I will send to him as a transmitter. And so now uh, I know somehow, I, I know the physical characteristics of my system and I know that it's likely that somehow some error will occur. At the same time, it's also really a uh, reasonable assumption that the error will not be too big or at least with a big probability the error will not be too big. Otherwise my channel is just completely useless. So I, I assume that, okay, so within the, uh, uh, this green round of each of my red code, red code words, there is this error ball, so the cloud of expected errors. And so it means that, for example, I sent one word, like this word here, and then because of the, uh, my, my channel was imperfect, so the signal could be somewhere in here. And since it's still inside of this, uh, green ball, then I will, I will know that this was actually the original message. And so first I will be able to detect an error because my, what, what I sent does not coincide with what, uh, if, if my, if this, what my, where I'm pointing to, if this is the uh, channel, of the signal received, then I will know that somehow, the, first the error did occur because it doesn't coincide with any of the code words, but I will also know that this is the closest code word, so this is the way to decode. And so now you see that somehow the game we are playing, of course we, f we want to have many, many code words to be able to send more different messages and more meaningful uh, um, information. We also, we, we want these uh, code words to be uh, f far, uh, far enough from each other, so we do not want our error clouds to intersect. We don't want them to have interior points. And this is where the packing problem is. Coming. So this is exactly the packing problem inside of my uh, channel. <clears throat> and so now the game somehow becomes to, to pack as many error balls into the channel. And uh, okay, so I also told you that uh, <clears throat> the work of uh, uh, 
Uh, Claude Shannon was similar to the work of Richard Hemming, even though, as you've seen, that what the kind of what uh, Richard Hemming was dealing with was this uh, punctured tapes, and somehow each uh, bit of information on this punctured tape it's either zero or one, and so it does not look a lot like my continuous uh, channel that I show to you here. So what is the trick here? And the trick here is that this time Euclidean space is not that uh, useful for us, so we have to think bigger and we have to... Oh, oh my God. Okay, I will stay away from that. Uh, so what we should do, uh, we should go further into mathematical abstraction and allow ourselves think of other metric spaces. And what is a metric space? I will not go into somehow uh, definitions as, we, as if we were in a lecture for mathematical students, but essentially it means that we have some set of points which we have decided, defined, and we also introduced some meaningful notion of distance between these points. And this does not have to be a Euclidean distance anymore. It could be a different metric, and usually the convention is that it has to satisfy some uh, uh, properties that uh, Euclidean metric still has, and one uh, property that turns out to be very important and useful is the triangle inequality. So in Euclidean space, we know that triangle inequality holds. So if we have a triangle, then the distance, the each side is shorter than the sum of two other sides or that the short, uh, and so if you have another, in our metric space, we have, have another distance, but the triangle inequality is something we want to keep because it's very useful and convenient. And so this is the space actually Hemming introduced and he was working with, because uh, his messages, they were not real numbers, they were all sequences of zeros and ones. So something what uh, computers like and can understand. And so what he have done, he also uh, realized that this, sequ this set of sequences can also have a geometric structure to it. And here, uh, somehow, it's a magic of number two, that this time Euclidean geometry is still not as useful. If you have alphabet with more letters, then it's true, it's a totally different space, and it's not easy to find connection between this space and Euclidean space. But with zeros and ones, actually, so let we can uh, see that, uh, so the having space, it consists of all uh, sequences from, of zeros and ones that have given lengths. And for example, if you write, we can write down all, sequ all sequences of lengths two of zeros and ones, and there are exactly four of them. And so now what I'm doing here, I will just draw uh, on the plane, I will draw points with these coordinates. And what I will get, this would be just a square. So if, on a, if you think of a Cartesian plane, and this would be a point with coordinates 0, 0, this point with coordinates 1, 0, this point with coordinates 0, 1, and the point with coordinates 1, 1. And so here we do have a, actually, somehow we see that uh, uh, the Euclidean distance between points, it's, it still tells us something useful. For example, if we think how to define a distance between two different sequences, one natural way, which Hamming introduced, was if you have two sequences, let's look at uh, how many different symbols they have. So we, have, we compare these two strings, write them one by another, and we look at, at each place whether the symbols coincide or not. And if they do not coincide, we, not, we count number of all places where they do not coincide. For example, if you have this string 0, 0, and the string 1, 0, uh, then here the distance, Hamming distance between them would be 1, because somehow the first position is different and the second position is in fact the same. So here the distance is one and the Euclidean distance is also one. And so here the distance between this point and this point, so if we compute the Hamming distance, so the number of coordinates which are uh, different, we see that uh, the first place in our sequence, the now the digits do not match, and at the second, they also do not match. And so there are two, the distance is two, and the Euclidean distance between them is 
square root of 2. So they are different, but somehow still there is a nice relation between them. And we can do the same for, uh, uh, for, for uh, sequences of length 3, and then we will get a three-dimensional cube. And here again, we can check that uh, Hamming distance, it will be equal to the Euclidean distance between points only squared. So for example, the, maybe the two f points that are farther away, the big diagonal in the cube. So we see that the Hamming distance here is three, and the Euclidean distance between these two points is the square root of three. And so geometry is still uh, useful, and so what I draw here, this is the four-dimensional Hamming ball, and so this is also somehow one way one could think about these higher dimensions and higher dimensional objects. And so for the... Uh, <clears throat> and so now if what, what Hemming introduced was exactly the same. So he realized that when we are sending a codes, we just we have to predefine our number of code words. And then, but, but in his case, the points, uh, the centers of the balls, they cannot be located anywhere in the Euclidean space, but they have to say coincide with one of the vertices of this hypercube of the lens of the code he's working with. And then he will choose these vertices so that the, the, he could choose many of them, lots of them, and at the same time that they are quite far away from each other so that they are, the cloud of, of errors would not intersect and that he could not only detect errors but also correct them. And so there was actually another important difference between the work of uh, Hemming and uh, Claude Shannon. So what, uh, another important thing that uh, uh, Claude Shannon uh, realized is that, for example, when we are sending this type of uh, signal, then many things are outside of our control anyways. And so it means that if we have, if our balls do intersect a little bit, or few of our balls intersect, it's not all that terrible because we have this uh, uh, conditions that are outside of our control anyways. So it means that now if we, if we allow our, some of our balls to intersect a little bit, uh, then it means that our error could occur not only because of some uh, outside uh, uh, factors, but also because of the design of our code. But if the probability is small, it's still not all that terrible for any practical application. And so what he, he actually introduced he suggested to search not for like exact uh, packings, but for these averaged versions of packings, or, or packings where balls do not intersect with big probability. And uh, for, for this type of problem, it, it is a much more fruitful approach, which also opens way to many good codes. On the other hand, what uh, Hemming was studied, he really studied the case uh, where he does not allow his error clouds to intersect at all, when, we do, when by our design we do not introduce any errors ourselves. And so actually his problem is more, is, more, is closer to the sphere packing problem I was uh, talking about. And so, uh, actually another, uh, and so now an interesting, maybe after what I've told you, there will be no surprise that, for example, E8 lattice, which is, a, as I already told you, it's a solution of the sphere packing problem in, in dimension uh, eight. It's also closely connected to the coding theory. And for example, one of the, well, there is a code, eight dimensional code, which is called Hemming code. It is, it is in fact closely related to the E8 lattice. So E8 lattice can be easily constructed from eight dimensional Hemming code and eight dimensional Hemming code can be easily constructed from the E8 lattice. Uh, and so there is another marvelous mathematical object, the Leach lattice. And the story of Leach lattice is very interesting. So the, 
E8 lattice, it was actually known to mathematicians for a very long time. It was discovered at the second part of 19th century, and then it played a lot of role in classification of Lie groups in uh, many, many areas of uh, mathematics. And uh, uh, Lich lattice, it was something that mathematicians did not know about yet at the uh, 1950s. And uh, uh, so before and before it was discovered, so the uh, Marcel Galley, he has uh, he he worked at the Bell Labs. He thought about creating these uh, codes after having introduced error correcting codes. So there was of course a question of how to find. So okay, we have this general theory, general philosophy, but then how to find uh, concrete good codes. And so people were working on, on proposing those codes at that time. And so one code proposed by uh, Golly was a, 20, was a uh, code of length 24. And it, turns, uh, it was an extremely interesting mathematical object. So it had many symmetries. And it was somehow what is called the perfect code. So for, from the coding theory, it was clear that Golly code could not be possibly improved. It was, in a, in a sense, uh, if you think of it as a packing of these uh, balls in a hemming, so hemming balls in a hemming space, then it's somehow a perfect packing where all this, actually it's not only packing, but essentially all the space is covered by those uh, balls. So it, it was an uh, uh, extraordinary object in coding theory, and uh, in 1960s, uh, Canadian mathematician John Leach, he uh, used uh, Galley code to construct an Euclidean lattice. So this, uh, the Galley code, it was a, somehow a sequence of zeros and ones, which so that the, of different, the big number of words, which would have a, a big distance, big Hamming distance between them, and. Uh, uh, so, so, so John Leach, he was able to take this binary code and to turn it into a lattice in Euclidean space. And here, what he did was a bit similar to what we have done before with the cube. So we took these uh, elements of a uh, Hemming space and embedded them into Euclidean space. And so what, what John Leach did was, was a bit more complicated. He had to play with it. He had to first find a nice way to embed uh, Galley code into Euclidean space. Uh, then he would have to uh, spend the whole lattice with, with, with this embedding. And then he, what he discovered that this was not a really great sphere packing, uh, but he could take another copy of the same lattice and shift it. And then this, uh, maybe not, okay, maybe not two, maybe it was actually more copies of that. And so then he could take several copies of the lattice and then this created actually a great packing in dimension 24. So this happened in uh, uh, 1960s. And then in uh, 1980s, uh, so uh, John Conway started uh, uh, studying the works of John Leach. And what he discovered is that the lattice constructed by John Leach has a really great group of symmetries. So it's not only a very good packing, but it's also an extremely symmetrical mathematical object. And so this is how he uh, discovered a famous uh, monster group. And so till now, this is the biggest uh, uh, simple finite group that we know. And at that point, um, what pe people were very interested in, in classifying all simple finite groups. And so some of those, so, there, so for, for a long time, people know of whole families of groups. Uh, they were known classically. And then at some point, people discovered the, so to so, so say, exotic groups or paria groups. So they were also finite groups. They were simple. Uh, but, uh, but also, they did not fit into any of the previously known families. And since they did not have a family, they were called the paria groups. And somehow there was a theory, there was of course this question, so we have found these objects, but have we found all of them? Or there will be more? Or maybe they all fit into some infinite 
family. And so John Conway, so by studying the a group of automorphisms of Leech lettuce, uh, John Conway have found this monster group, and this is the biggest, no, the biggest uh, finite simple group. And now we also have a complete classification of finite simple groups. So we do know that the list is complete, and there will be no bigger simple uh, finite group, so at least we think that we know it. It's a very, very long proof, which, yeah. <laughs> but I think people do have a lot of confidence in it, but now many of many petitions who have written, worked on this, this was called an Atlas project, so, and many some of the people who worked on it now already died, so. So maybe this is also as we, uh, one of the good candidates for formali formalization in mathematics would be the classification of uh, for simple finite groups, probably this would be an insanely difficult project, but it seems because first it is so important and that proof, the proof is, the classification is so long and I believe that there is no living person who understands all of it. It would be really nice to have it somehow formalized for the future generations. And so then the study of the leech lattice leads to a lot of other beautiful mathematics and theoretical physics. So, and, uh, so here is a, a portrait of uh, Richard Borchardt who received a, a <clears throat> Fields Medal for studying vertex or introducing vertex operator algebras and resolving what was called the moonshine conjecture about the monster group. So there is a lot of somehow very beautiful mathematics that came from uh, solving a difficult engineering problem. Uh, and so the Galay code, it was used in many things practically. So for example, it was used in some of the space missions. I think this mission was launched in 1970s. And it was somehow, at that, that, that time it was um, important to, because sending signal from the Voyager was not, not easy and it somehow also there was not, no ability to pack many things on it. So having somehow a nice small code which helps to decode was ex extremely important. Uh, so also, the, uh, for example, Golay code was used in CD disks. Maybe you still remember these shiny things. The CD disks, they also used uh, Golay code in there to somehow, so that you can scratch your, scratch your disk once and it still would work somehow, but then you scratch it second, third time and it's over. So. <laughs> and so maybe the last thing I wanted to part I want to talk about is, so like, uh, <clears throat> uh, one important question in sphere, in sphere packing and in coding theory is to know what happens with the sphere packing density as dimension goes to infinity. And so, as for me, for pure mathematicians, this is just such an uh, interesting theoretical question, but there is also a practical uh, angle to it so for example, uh, one of the this, uh, fundamental discoveries of uh, uh, Claude Shannon was that uh, the error correction is most efficient uh, when we send not short chunks of uh, uh, signals, but the long ones. For example, if we have a sequences of zeros and ones, so error correcting short chunks of them is somehow, we, if, if we do it like that, we will not succeed, we will be limited. Uh, so it's most e efficient if we uh, send long signals. And if we send sending long sing c signals in our geometric picture, it means working with big dimensions. And uh, some, uh, the, the best case if the dimension is somehow infinite, uh, unbounded. So knowing what is the best uh, packing density in uh, very big dimensions, it, it has this practical angle as well. And so what we know here, so it's, uh, I mean, uh, so we do know the, uh, on one hand that uh, the things are not too bad and that if we have dimension D, we could achieve density which is at least two to the minus D. 
And so here is a very simple uh, geometric argument which to, tells us that if a saturated sphere packing in d-dimensional Euclidean space has always density at least 2 to the minus d. So what is a saturated packing? A saturated packing means that uh, we have a packing of uh, balls so, uh, so, so such that we cannot add any single ball to this uh, packing so that it will not intersect with one of the already existing in our packing. So for example, if you think of this uh, uh, balls, uh, uh, disks, so that is a two-dimensional picture because it's easier for visualization. So if you think of the uh, <clears throat> balls inside of this blue box, it is, seems like it's difficult to squeeze one more ball in here without intersecting one of the of already existing balls in our packing, and so it is a saturated packing. But now how we see that it has density uh, at least 2 to the minus d. Uh, so what we are going to do, we are going to make our picture like this. So first, because of here, for the purpose of visualization, of course, in my slides, I cannot allow for infinite packing, so I have a boundary here. Uh, but we agreed with you that boundary is not important, and uh, somehow we think of a boundary as being somewhere very far away. But here I uh, uh, colored in this uh, pale red, uh, the area where somehow our, I cannot put uh, centers of a new ball if I want it to still be inside of the box and don't intersect the existing one. So I painted this area around the boundary. And if my box is very big, then some of this area that I took away, it would be very small comparing to the total volume inside of the box. And now I, I don't want my new ball to intersect with the old ones. And what that means, it means that I take any of the previous black balls and I grow, draw this red cloud around it. And the radius of this, so this would be also a cloud in the shape of a ball with the same center, and radius twice bigger than the radius of a black ball. And so now if I have a ball with a center inside of the red cloud, uh, then the distance from this point to the center of this ball would be smaller than 2. And it means that if I put another ball with uh, radius 1, then there will be an intersection. And if I put uh, uh, another uh, ball with center which is outside of this uh, red cloud, for example here, then there will be no intersection with uh, this ball. And so my uh, packing, it will be saturated if and only if all the red clouds cover my box completely. And if there would be some, some sp uncovered spot left inside of the box, I could just put a center of a new ball in there and uh, may make my packing even denser. But at the same time, if all the, uh, this, balls which are twice bigger if they cover my box. And again, I guess here we forget, we forget about the boundary. Boundary is unimportant. Uh, so if, uh, if they all cover my uh, box, it means that the sum of the volumes of these big red balls has to be uh, at least as big as the volume of, of the box. And now an important f fact is that if I have the d-dimensional ball and I increase its radius twi twice, then its volume will increase two to, to, to the power two to the power d. So in one dimension, if I take an interval which is twice longer, then the lens will also become twice bigger. And for the area of a disk, if I have a disk here, so the area of this disk is four times bigger than the area of this disk. And for a ball, for a three-dimensional ball, it will be eight time in increase, and in dimension d, the increase is d times. And so th this is where this 2 to the minus d is coming from. So we know that the volume of all red balls is at least the same as the volume of the box, and it means that the volume of all black balls inside is at least 2 to the minus d times the volume of the box. And uh, 
somehow here the, there is a very contra many counterintuitive and paradoxical things happen. So first of all, uh, it seems that we have got the saturated packings almost for free and maybe if we apply some smart design we could do better and we can do better in small dimensions. However, if we think of a very big dimension, the situation is opposite, that all explicit constructions, at least in Euclidean space that we have, they actually have dimension less than this one and it's like much less. So the best explicit constructions that we know, they are exponentially worse than this one. Uh, and another question is what's about upper bounds? So in the previous lectures we spoke about upper bounds. So maybe this two, two to the minus d, how, how close is it to the, what is theoretically possible? So this is also something we don't know. Uh, the only thing we do know, we do know that the uh, density of the densest packing in dimension d decays exponentially with the dimension. However, the exponent is not two. It's not like the e logarithm of two. It's, some, uh, it's another exponent which is a weaker one. So the difference between the best we can guarantee that exists and the things that we definitely know cannot exist is exponentially big. And so this is all I wanted to tell you about very big dimensions for today. So, uh, yeah, so I would like to congratulate you with Christmas, with upcoming Christmas and upcoming New Year. And also I'm ready to answer your questions about everything what you've heard about during these three lectures. So.